Good morning, Robert Road Baptist Church. Good morning, good morning Pastor Ron. God is good. All the time. All right, what's the rest of that? All the time. All the time. God is good. Oh, yes. You know, I, I, I don't hardly know where to begin this morning because I have heard some songs and I've heard some remarks, and it's amazing to me always that there's a master plan up there that we, we cannot even begin to comprehend sometimes. Some of those remarks and some of those songs will tie in with my message a little bit today, and you'll find out as we go along. Uh, today we're going to be uh, reviewing the book of Luke out of uh, chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. That's called the parable of the Good Samaritan. Fred made mention earlier about the turmoil, the strife that's going on in this life, this world. And sometimes we fail to show compassion on our neighbors, on our brothers and sisters. We had that song that said, freely, freely give. And that was the second line in that one verse, freely, freely give. And Theresa says something about, you can do something. You can go out there and serve in some capacity. And it's all about sharing. It's all about caring. Oh, what a friend we have in Jesus. You know, I think I heard it also play that one again. Just, just how blessed is it to be able to be here this morning and to understand the message from the Lord that he put it all together that today we get to talk about a little bit how maybe we can show some compassion out there and do good along the way. And we're also going to review the most important commandments. Hopefully understand our responsibilities to one another. But you know, uh, I always like to set out a, a few minutes of time for sharing a praise report, a testimony, something good uh, that's happened for you. On the other hand, if there's nothing good and you need help with something and you need prayer, we will gladly pray with you if you have a situation that needs attended just like we prayed for Lloyd earlier. So uh, the time is yours. Anybody have any comments, praise reports? Hey, I got one. Actually, I got more than one. I, I'm just so blessed. What I want to talk to you about this morning, just real briefly, is my most recent praise report is I got to meet and have a short conversation with Louise this morning. Right. And we probably one another up a little bit. You know, Louise and, 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 and the troubles that she's had to share and, and, and the burdens she's carried throughout her life. And we talk about things like, is the glass half full or is the glass half empty? And a lot of days it's hard to get up and say, yeah, it's half full. But some days it's just so depressing. Oh, arthritis has bit me so bad this week, you know, I just almost feel like crying sometimes. But the Lord is still good. The Lord is great. Hallelujah. That glass will remain half full as long as I'm here on this earth. Thank you, wow. Also sad a little bit about the news. Seems like there's only sadness in the news. And now we've got this building in Florida collapsed. The last count, nine souls have been lost and another 150 still missing. We ask why. Sometimes we don't know the answer. But there's a grand plan out there. But what we need to do, all you prayer warriors, pray for those families. Make them strong. Let's hope that those uh, rescue efforts will be able to bring out some more live bodies just, instead of just the remains of 150 poor souls that have gone on. Shall we pray? Father, well, I thank you for this opportunity to be here today at Rockford Road Baptist Church and to share this message. A message about being a good Samaritan. We get the opportunity to fellowship with our brothers and sisters. We thank you for the gift of salvation. You gave him your only son. That we can be forgiven for our sins and transgressions just by accepting Christ as Savior. Father, look out for all the families affected by that. That building coming down, uh, down in uh, this outside of Miami. Everything is going on in this world. Our prayers are never ending. But prayers are not just about asking. Prayers are also about thanking. 
confidence and we should never fail to pray before we don't give you the thanks for the blessings that you give us. And so today I'm going to say thanks on behalf of the church for all the blessings you give us in this precious day. Amen. So how many of you here today are good Samaritans? So beginning with verse 25, let me read to you. One 
day an angel in religious law, today we would call him an attorney, he stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? And the man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. The man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now, before we jump over into verse 30, Jesus then told him the story. And we know what that story is. He tells about a Jewish man that had, had been uh, traveling, and he'd been over in Jerusalem, and now he was returning or going to Jericho on down the road. So he was leaving, and he was set upon by some bandits. And he was robbed and he was beaten on, and he was left for dead, led there beside the road. Poor guy. And then by chance a priest came along, and he saw him laying over there. And what did that priest do? He took a look at him, and he crossed the road, and went all down the road on his way. And then next came the uh, temple assistant. A Levite came along. He also went over took a look at him. He didn't do anything to help him. He also passed him on by, went all down the road toward Jericho. Brothers and sisters, I just asked you for a minute to imagine. Can you imagine ignoring the pain and the suffering of your fellow man being compassion? No compassion was shown here. There was no act of kindness indicated whatever. So verse 30, we do read, Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothes, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. So our compassion is not to be driven necessarily by the worth of a person, but by the need. We talked about that earlier. In fact, Lisa and I spoke about that for a moment even. Jesus says a certain man today, we, we, we'd probably say just some guy. You know, some guy was robbed and wounded and left for dead. He needed help in the worst way. And as that unknown victim lay there alongside the road, suffering so, a series of three different in, individuals came along the way. And the first passerby is introduced now in verse 31. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. The priest came down the road, but when he saw the man, he crossed to the other side, and he just continued on his journey as if nothing was happening at all. Some of our studies tells us that priest might have been excused by some, because, you know, if he'd gone over and touched him, and he had been deceased, then that would have made him ceremoniously unclean, I think is the words that I read. He wouldn't be able then to go out and to uh, carry out his duties once that had happened. Well, I've got a word or word for that, but I'm not going to tell him right here. I just keep him to myself. It's best, best that I do that. But I want you to notice that both he and the Levite came along and asked for coming down the road. So apparently they've been over here in Jerusalem and then gone down to Jericho. So they're coming down the road. They've been to the city and headed home. Can you believe what we're reading here, church? Just take a look at that man and go your own way. No concern for your fellow man at all. No love. You know, this is one of the most shocking aspects of the parable when Jesus told it. You see, the priest was considered the holiest man among all the Jews. He was taught the scriptures. He was entrusted to uh, offer sacrifices for the sins of the people. He was able to go further into the temple than anybody else. So if anybody is going to reflect the character of God, it would be the priest. 
Then the second pastor by we introduced in verse 37. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. Well, at least he went over and took a look at him. You know, in, 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 in today's vernacular, it'd be what we would call rubberneck. Because you know what happens when you see an accident on the side of the road? And I, and I don't think anybody's exempt. If, if they are, it's a very small amount of people. But most people, when they sit, they just drive along real slow because they want to see what's going on. They rubberneck to see what's going on. And that's what that mean I did. He went over and said, wow, look at that. Hmm. Gee, that's too bad. No. He didn't feel the need to do anything at all to help. Well, I tell you, there is a really strong message here, church, and that is that compassion is based on need. It is not based on work. And then we get into verse 33 that reads, But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. What is compassion? I don't have a great answer. I didn't look it up in the dictionary, but it's a feeling that's inside me. It's a feeling that I'm feeling something here. Maybe I need to do something. I need to react in some sort of way. You know, it would have been shocking right here for Jesus to have told the people that this man was helped by just an ordinary man. But it's not even a Jew helping out a Jew. Here it is, it's a Samaritan helping out a Jew. And we know how that they were at, at, at odds with each other back in that day. His fellow Jews ignored him. And you know, given the mutual hatred that existed back in the day between the Jews and the Samaritan, it might have been more likely that that Samaritan would have just gone over and finished him off. I'm done with him, yeah. That very well could happen. Well, today, this is what we call the story, or rather the parable of the Good Samaritan. In fact, brothers and sisters, Good Samaritan has now become a part of our everyday language. But that was not the phrase back in those days that we're talking about now. In fact, they probably didn't even use the words good and Samaritan in the same sentence. Because there was no good Samaritan in the eyes of the Jews. But the passage says, when he saw him, he had compassion. Now there's a Greek word out there for compassion, which I can't begin to pronounce. It's an ugly word. It's very vivid. It kind of refers, I think, to the New Testament and the Bible or something like that. Sounds really gross. And I think it's the equivalent today of what we talk about when we say we have a gut feeling. Anybody here ever have a gut feeling? Amen. That might be akin to compassion in some way or other. A gut feeling. And it comes from way down deep inside. And sometimes it starts and it just grows and grows and grows and grows. And you can't sleep at night. You wake up worried. You wonder, what can I do? What should I do? You know, this Samaritan saw that pitiful man lying in agony beside the road. His heart churned with the church. And he couldn't pass him by without doing something. And that's the way compassion works, the same as the gut feeling, if you will. You got to do something. And that Samaritan looked over there at that almost half dead man laying there beside the road, something happened in his gut. Something that made it impossible for him to walk away. He could not do it. He didn't decide to help that guy based on how worthy he was. I don't know if the word worth even entered in his mind, but it was need. A simple little four-letter word. The man needed some help. He helped him because of how needy he was. We cannot, in all our studies, find any logical reason at all for that Samaritan 
to do what he did. Not only to help him out, you're going to find out that he even spent some money, as we'll continue here this morning, helping out an enemy, if you will, an enemy indeed, of all the people that passed this injured man by, the Samaritan had the least reason to help him out. You know, back in his own society, he was kind of considered a no account. And what he's doing there is not going to change his status back in his own hometown, back in his community. So what we might have learned, I hope we have at least learned that compassion also feels something. Compassion not only feels something, compassion does something. This is where we're back to the beginning of the service today. <coughs> What did I read earlier? What did the song say? Does anybody remember? Give. Hmm? Right. Give. Freely, freely give. Serve. Hmm. So not only was the Samaritan's compassion based on the need rather than the word, but it caused that Samaritan to do something so deep that it had to be expressed in action. I'm going to read to you now from verse 34. This is what we're told. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. I didn't read there that he passed by on the other side. Let me look at that again. No, he did not pass by on the other side. He moved toward the injured man. He didn't cross over the road, church. You've got to move towards people if you want to show compassion, if you want to build relationships. And it's not something that just mystically happens. It takes a concentrated effort. Many, many times it's not a bit convenient. I don't want you to forget now that the Samaritan is now moving towards someone who, if that someone had been conscious, would probably despise him. In fact, if you stop and think about it, if the shoe were on the other foot, you think that you would have done the same thing for that Samaritan? Don't know what might have happened if the situation were reversed. So what now we read here is there's six key verbs that Jesus details for us. I want to read them now. It's just how active this man's compassion was. And I want you to understand the words in this, in this verse. If nothing else, take these home with you. What did he do? He went to the man. That's the first thing he did. He didn't pass him by. Number one, he went to the man. He took some action. And what did he do when he got there? He bandaged up his wounds. Woo, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Help is on the way. In addition to that, he poured some wine on there and he poured some oils. I read some conflicting statements about that. I, I guess it's a form of, I don't know if it, if it numbs the wound or, or, or exactly if it has healing powers. I don't have the answer. But he did do what he could, and he poured the oil and wine on there to give that man relief. So he stepped up. He went over to the man, and he's taking care of him. And then when he got him all bandaged up, what did he do? Hey, he picked him up and put him on the donkey. Yeah, he did. He didn't walk away and leave him and say, that's been done. He put him on the donkey, and then what? Yeah, right. He brought him on over to the inn. That's number five. He did some stuff here, didn't he, folks? He brought him to the end, and then he took care of him by trusting his care to the innkeeper and paying some money to take care of him. You know, in every one of those acts, he demonstrated compassion. He responded in a very practical way, in a very timely way, in an unselfish way. You know, putting him on his own donkey meant he had to, he had to walk along. He didn't get a ride anymore. What a man. What a Samaritan. You know, it's important to recognize that he did take the time to take care of him. The church, you know, that we're not able to help 
everybody all the time, but we can help somebody along the way in some way or another. So compassion not only does something, but compassion costs something. On the next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and he said this in verse 35, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. Those are really profound in my mind. You may, he, he'd gone the extra mile already. He'd taken him to the end and asked him to keep him look out for This recovering victim, and he paid some money up front. And then he promised, I'm going to return, and if you have incurred any other expenses, I will make you whole. I will repay you for that. He left money to take care of that. I don't think there's anything more that this American could have done to show compassion for this man. So compassion costs something. And I think compassion demonstrates our relationship to God. Now at the conclusion of the story, he asked the lawyer one additional question in verse 36. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? Mm. You know, the lawyer almost choked on his words. He couldn't even bring himself to say Samaritan. And he responded in verse 37 by saying, He who showed mercy on him. Wow. And then for the second time, he tells this man to do something in order to inherit eternal life. And the verse continues with Jesus saying to him, Go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. Just four words. And why does Jesus say this? It's because he realized that this man will really not turn to him for salvation until he turns from his dependence on trying to do something to earn eternal life. Or said another way, it looks like maybe he's trying to buy himself into, into heaven. You don't buy yourself into heaven. You don't want to do something to earn your way into heaven. It's already there and it's been bought and paid for. Just be a good neighbor. You know, this lawyer's left without any excuses or any indication that he wanted you know, the second question that he asked was, who is my neighbor? The question was now turned on him. He said, what kind of neighbor am I? Think about that. I'm going to jump and move to 1 John just for a minute. A couple of verses in chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. One of the most convicting passages in the Bible says, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us. We also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whosoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, do not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And then James his practical principles for living the Christian life says this, if a brother or sister is naked, destitute, need of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warm and filled, but do not give them the things they need for the body, what does it profit? That's also by faith. If it does not have works, faith. So now we've learned that compassion will demonstrate whether or not we have a relationship with God. It looks like maybe time. Well, if I talk real fast, I'll get you out of here so you can have your lunch and get ahead of the Methodist today. But... <laughs> well, you know, like the I can get out early for lunch. I am going to share this story with you. I groaned as I saw the flashing construction vehicles in the line of red, red brake lights ahead of me. I was taking my son to school. I hadn't left early enough to 
allow for the delays like this. Some cars were already making U-turns to find an alternate route where they needed to go. But our detour was going to be much longer, so I decided to wait a few more minutes before uh, making the knee-jerk reaction. So sure enough, a few minutes later, the car started moving at its slope. Whew, wow. So as I approached the calls of the backup, I could see that it wasn't just construction. There was a car there with a smashed front end, sitting in the middle of the four-lane road, and there was a man lying on the ground next to the driver's side. Two construction workers were kneeling beside that man. Clearly that accident had just happened. Emergency workers were not there yet. It was a horrifying feeling to pass by the man on the ground, not knowing what condition he was in, not even knowing if he was alive. I think maybe what happened there is a little bit of that rubber neck we talked about. Mm -hmm. Over there, huh? Look at that. Yeah. And my son and I did pray for him, for the others involved. And then we were fairly silent during the rest of the drive until my son said to me, he said, you know, Mr. Smith would have stopped to see if he could help. <sighs> Mr. Smith. And that was just an innocent observation. He didn't mean it as a guilt trip for me. But I was convicted nevertheless. I should have stopped, but I didn't. There's a modern day parable of this American. I'm not the priest passing by on the other side of the road. Well, there's a number of reasons. I shouldn't stop. By now, we're on the verge of being late for school. Wow, there's a good reason. Huh? The man on the road, he's probably been helped already by those construction workers. I didn't want to be in the way. What could I have done? But still, I felt the guilt inside. I suppose you start to feel a little bit passionate, maybe. Or maybe a little bit of that gut feeling, Robert, that we talked about. Some deep down even a little bit now when his son had made that remark. I could have prayed for them a little voice whispered in my head. I knew that was true. You know, so oftentimes, folks, when we're asked, what can I do? I'm not doing enough. How can I serve? At the very least, we can pray. Prayer. If I pray for you, maybe my prayer along with yours will do something to help get that prayer answered. At the very least, I can stop and see if there's anything I can do. My son's school would have understood if I had stopped. This was more important. Anybody out there recall a time in their life when they had a similar situation? I'm not talking about just a car accident that might have happened. Brothers and sisters, maybe it's somebody that came to you and needed a listening ear. There's something on their mind. There's something troubling. They need somebody to talk to and you turn away out of that time. <laughs> Go play. Maybe you didn't get out this week or this month to go see Grandpa or Grandpa over in the home because they got the Alzheimer's. They're not even going to know you if you go, so why bother? Yeah. Maybe your church needed some Sunday school teachers. You made some lame excuse to get out of the office. <coughs> Maybe you have a friend or a neighbor or acquaintance or someone that's moving. Could be even next door. And you don't even offer if you're able to help them load or unload the home. You know, serving your neighbor doesn't mean you have to do something really dramatic, like giving CPR to an injured man on the side of the road. But it's often in your Serving others does require sacrifice. Think a minute now about this actual parable of the Good Samaritan from Luke 10, 25 through 37. We just reviewed it. The hated Samaritan came upon this Jew, laid beside the river. He'd been robbed, he'd been beaten. He'd been left for dead, and he'd been passed by by both the priest and the Levi. This uh, Samaritan.
care of the natural carry for him putting on his own dog. Took him to the end for care. Reimbursing any expenses. Today, that might be something like us following an ambulance over to the hospital. Sure, we're going to do that. We're going to go in and say, he's got no insurance, let me pay for that. You think that's going to happen? None of us can live up to such high expectations, perhaps. But let's remember why Jesus told the parable in the first place. The lawyer was testing him, asking him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And you know the answer to that one by now. There's nothing we can do to earn heaven. No matter how good we are, we will never be good enough. That's right. Amen. And that is not an excuse, though, not to serve others. Jesus meant it. He said you can't earn heaven by your good works. But he's not saying we shouldn't help our fellow man. In fact, he really states that we are expected to serve our neighbors. In Matthew 7, 12, we read, The golden rule, do unto others what you would have them do unto you. I'll never know what would happen. If I stopped the car with the accident, probably wouldn't have been anything too dramatic. Still, we should have had courage to stop. But I thank God that the construction workers were there. They jumped into action doing what they could. They showed compassion. They turned over vehicle lights in the darkness so people could see what was going on. They helped the man out of the car. They attended to him while they were waiting for the ambulance. And for all I know, maybe they prayed for him too. So I'm going to ask the church, as you go through your day, day by day, I want you to watch for opportunities where you can serve others. And most of the time, it won't be real convenient. I'm going to tell you, paying it forward is so great. It, it, it's just so wonderful to be able to head forward. Many times you don't realize the fruits of your labor from head forward. But remember, serving others is serving Jesus himself. I'm going to wrap this up here. In our message today, Jesus is separating the person who has a real relationship with God from the Merely religious. We saw what those merely religious folks did when they saw the beaten Jews laying there on the side of the road. They kept walking. In fact, they crossed the street and kept walking. Merely religious. <coughs> Perhaps you've identified with this man's question what must I do to go to hell? The answer is the same. Stop trying to inherit heaven by doing his step. Instead, believe in Jesus. Trust in him that he's already paid for the for you. So the bottom line church we're getting into is that Jesus is not concerned about identifying who our neighbors are as much as he is about us being a neighbor. And that man who fell into the hands of those robbers didn't need to know who his neighbor was. He simply needed one person to be there's no message, no sermon complete unless there's a moment of invitation. I want to ask you now, are you a neighbor? Are you saved from washing the blood of the Lamb? Are you right in your walk with the Lord? If you want to have that personal relationship with God and you don't know if you need to feel the need to renew or strengthen that relationship, I'd be pleased to meet and pray with you. We can do it right now. We can do it at your time, at your place, uh, whatever's convenient. We know that the uh, altar here at Robert Road Baptist Church is always open. I'm so thankful here to meet with uh, my family at Robert Road Baptist Church. I believe we have all here acknowledge God as our Savior. But many times, many times we struggle as we go our way. Many times we do a little thing that's called backsliding. In fact, I think it happens to most of us way too frequently. We have a forgiving God. 
we've lived in here time and time again. You say, okay, Ron, I forget. I go about your work. Thank you. 